will impact their willingness to come back for care. And so we have what feels like sometimes a tension between um, disclosure and privacy and can feel a bit like a fight, um, sort of pulling the teddy bear (laughs) at both ends. Um, But even if you don't go away with all the particulars, I'm hoping by the end of today's presentation, um, you will walk away with at least a belief that it is possible to find a balance um, and to find a balance that both centers young people and their families and acknowledges the importance of privacy, but also allows us to facilitate sharing of information in a way that will help us also benefit uh, young people and uh, really leverage the kind of collaborative uh, school-based programs that we've started to create in the state. Um, Now, a lot of this does come down to confidentiality laws, and we're going to walk through them today. But in general, when we take a step back, all confidentiality laws look very similar. Um, They, in the end, will establish what pretty much cannot be disclosed what must be disclosed, and by must, I mean things like, you know, mandated child abuse reporting. You have no discretion. You need to disclose if your child abuse uh, reporting duty has been triggered and you are a mandated reporter. And then there's this really interesting space in most confidentiality laws that we put in that middle where the law may allow Um, someone to disclose information, but it doesn't require them to. And this is where having the right tools in place, like uh, memorandums of understanding, uh, forms, um, addressing really important issues like ethics and practice, um, professional training, and even issues of trust can impact Uh, end up making a big difference about uh, whether or not you created sort of a a relationship in which uh, information can be um, shared and uh, in a way that both supports privacy but also supports sharing. Um, All right, so as Sierra said, we're going to walk through a couple sets of laws, laws that control release of health records, laws that control release of school records, and and then talk about what happens when services are being uh, provided on site, which law applies, and then talk about some information sharing examples. Um, Much of the information that I'll be uh, talking about today is from the HIPAA or FERPA primer, which you can find on the Teen Health Law website. But what we also wanted to introduce today is that the information from that primer has now been put into an interactive website, which you can find at schoolhealthcenters.org backslash HIPAA FERPA. Um, So it's the content of the primer. um, But in addition, uh, we've added some Uh, case studies, we've added some additional resources, and we'll be continuing to add more um, to the website, including some model forms. Um, It's it's a a really great opportunity to allow the primer to live and add information based on questions and uh, models that you share with us. So I'll be pointing back to that uh, website um, today and uh, encourage you to take a look at it um, after we finish. All right, so let's start by talking about um, health information. And what I mean is uh, the control of information uh, held by health or mental health care providers. So when can they share it with others? Um, When we're talking about health information, we actually have to think about both federal and state laws. At the federal level, we have HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Um, HIPAA sets sort of a ground floor, a base level of confidentiality nationally. But what HIPAA also says is that to the extent your state has any confidentiality laws that provide greater protection, greater confidentiality, then those state laws uh, control. And in California, we do have such laws. We have the Confidentiality of Medical Information Act, which covers uh, most health records and some mental health records. And then we have the Landerman Petri Short Act, which covers uh, like inpatient hospitalization and certain other mental health records. 
Um, in addition to those, there are some other federal and state laws that protect uh, medical or mental health information based on a funding stream or the type of services pro provided. Uh, one such law is a federal law that protects substance abuse treatment records, and I'll be uh, mentioning that one um, today. Um, but, but one thing to know is that even though the primer is called HIPAA or FERPA, and even though we tend to refer to HIPAA in California, for the most part, we're actually following California law. So the rules that healthcare providers follow in California may actually look a little bit different than the rules that someone's following in Nevada or Massachusetts or North Carolina. Um, so it's important if you're looking for model forms to copy for your program or MOUs that you look for um, things that ha are in California because uh, folks in other states are following different rules. Um, so who is subject to these rules? HIPAA applies to what are called covered entities and business associates, it's sort of fancy words, but in the end it means healthcare providers, health plans, healthcare clearinghouses, health clinics. Um, there are a few healthcare providers who may not actually be subject to HIPAA because they don't do anything um, interactive uh, on, online, but for the most part, uh, most healthcare providers who are working outside of a school uh, entity would be covered by HIPAA and they would be covered by California law. Um, the general rule under HIPAA and California law is that healthcare providers must protect the confidentiality of personal, individually identifiable health information. And as a general practice, in order to disclose that information to anyone else, they must have a signed authorization. Now there are exceptions, as we noted earlier, that would allow or require disclosure even without that signed release, and we'll flag a few of those, um, and the website talks about them in greater detail. Um, but our gold standard really is that written release. So you can always share information if there's a valid written authorization, and having such an authorization really allows you to shape both how much and what is shared with whom and for what purposes in a way that uh, using some of the exceptions in HIPAA just does not. Um, if you don't have that release, you, need, you are only allowed to share if an exception allows or requires it. Um, so let's talk about those authorization forms for a second. Who signs the form? Um, in California, the minor must sign if records relate to services the minor consented to or could have consented to. Otherwise, it's what we call a legal representative, which is typically a parent or guardian. But if you're dealing with young people who are in foster care or um, who are in alternative custody situations, um, that may be something you need to check on with legal counsel. But for the most part, uh, it would be a, a parent or guardian if it's not a minor consent service. Um, if you work in a middle or high school, that means it's really important to understand what minor consent uh, covers because that's gonna impact who signs your forms. Um, in California, minors can consent to pregnancy-related care at any age. Um, they can consent to sexual assault treatment at any age. Um, they can consent to outpatient mental health counseling when they're 12 or older. They can consent to substance abuse treatment and diagnosis when they're 12 or older, um, STD uh, testing, treatment, and prevention when they're 12 or older, and youth who are 15 or older living apart from their parents and managing their own financial affairs also can consent to their own health care. Um, we have a chart that describes all of the minor consent laws in full at teenhealthlaw.org. There's also a link to that minor consent chart in the School Health Center's additional resources uh, page on that website. Um, if you want to have the citations and, and more information about exactly what is a minor consent service in California. But just as an example, um, Jordan, ninth grader, comes to school-based health center because uh, they've been using their parents' prescription for benzodiazepines for an anxiety um, since starting high school. Jordan's been running low and is starting to feel anxious. The school-based health center provider talks with Jordan about substance misuse and, and Jordan decides they would like to be connected to services 
but really don't want their parent to know. Um, so <clears throat> the question is, can Jordan access services without parent guardian consent? This is exactly why we have minor consent laws in our state, uh, because we know that there are some young people who may choose simply not to seek care if they know they need to engage their parents from the get-go. And we need to make sure that the door is open for folks like Jordan um, to access critical services uh, as early as possible. So this is a situation where Jordan would be able to be connected to um, a program for substance abuse diagnosis and possible treatment based on Jordan's consent. Um, okay, another case, Joey's nine and has been receiving therapy from a private co clinician in the community. His parents want the therapist to talk to Joey's homeroom school teacher in order to help the teacher understand what support Joey needs in class. So somewhat like the original case we looked at uh, at the start of the webinar, uh, we're trying to foster collaboration here. Great, everyone's on board. May the therapist talk to the teacher based on the parent's verbal consent? Um, the answer is no. HIPAA does require a signed authorization, um, although in this case we have everyone on board, so that shouldn't be a huge barrier. Um, we just need to make sure that the form they use complies with HIPAA. Um, it is really common to see forms in use that do not include all the elements that are required by HIPAA, including um, a number of uh, <coughs> advisements, but it's also important to flag that California includes some additional elements. So, for example, in California law, an authorization form must be in 14-point font if it's uh, less than 14 point font, it's not valid. So really important to make sure your authorization forms comply with HIPAA and California law and the requirements for those uh, forms, the elements that are required are listed on the website and in the primer. <coughs> um, in this case, who would sign it? It would be Joey's parent. If Joey were 16 and receiving mental health therapy under Joey's own consent, then Joey would sign that release form. Even if mom and dad are involved and supportive, um, it would still be Joey's signature. All right, as we said, there are some exceptions that allow a healthcare provider to share information, even if there's not a written authorization in place. Um, there's a number of exceptions, um, including an emergency exception, which allows uh, healthcare providers to share information when they believe that that disclosure is necessary to prevent or lessen a serious and imminent threat to the health or safety of a reasonably foreseeable victim. Um, child abuse reporting exception to comply with mandated reporting laws, uh, court order. Um, all of these are described in more detail on the website and in the primer, so I won't go into them uh, right now for purposes of time. Um, but please feel free to submit any questions if you have any. Um, I do want to just walk through one of the exceptions. Um, so let's start with a case example to highlight uh, the value of this exception. So Liam and his parents visit Nancy Nurse to discuss the headaches that Liam's been having more and more frequently. Liam's parents mentioned that he just started taking some new allergy medication prescribed by a patty provider at the local clinic. Um, but they can't remember the name of it. While they're in the exam room, Nancy picks up the phone and calls Patty and says, hey, what is the name of that prescription that you gave to Liam? What, if anything, may Patty tell Nancy Nurse on the phone? So we know the general rule is that any disclosure of personally identifiable health information requires a written release. But we have an exception, and this here we have the language from California law, but it's also in HIPAA. Um, a healthcare provider may share information with other providers of healthcare, healthcare service plans, or other healthcare professionals or facilities for purposes of diagnosis or treatment, and that includes everything but psychotherapy notes. So our, our state law allows healthcare providers to share information between themselves in order to facilitate coordination of care. And that may be for referral, it may be because they're both providing care to the same patient at the same time. This is one of these exceptions, though, that says they may share, but they're not required to. And it's not uncommon to find professionals who say, just because I can, 
doesn't mean I should um, or I will. And, and they may have a number of reasons for that. It may be a risk management issue. It may be about ethics and practice. It may be the type of service they're providing and the commitment they've made to their patients. But this is where the opportunity to sit down at a table and talk about um, information sharing and create relationships can um, help you facilitate leveraging exceptions like this in the law. So, if you are at a school-based clinic and you're uh, looking for opportunities to create referrals and you're only looking to share name, address, basic information, perhaps there's opportunities to leverage this exception to create some protocols. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, there are some special laws that additionally protect certain types of information. I wanted to call attention to uh, one that applies to substance abuse treatment records. Um, it's a federal law called the Comprehensive Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism Prevention Treatment and Rehabilitation Act, which is a big mouthful. A lot of people simply refer to it as 42 CFR Part 2 or CAPTR, C-A-A-P-T-R. Um, it's one of the most protective confidentiality laws out there. It restricts disclosure of uh, identifying information, including even acknowledging that someone is a patient in a substance abuse treatment program. Um, if CAPTA applies um, to substance abuse treatment records, um, there really are very few exceptions that allow disclosure of information and without having a written authorization um, in place. Uh, if you are disclosing based on a court order, there's actually a whole special process the court needs to go to, through in order to release records that are protected by CAPTR. <laughs> in addition, there's some really strict limits on redisclosure. So if you receive information from a substance abuse treatment program, let's say your patient signs a release form authorizing disclosure um, to you, um, you also have to follow CAPTR and can't uh, re-release the information you receive. Now, CAPTR doesn't apply to records from every agency, but if you are referring to uh, a substance abuse treatment program or you are a substance abuse treatment program, it's really critical to know whether CAPTR applies to your program or not. And if it does apply, um, keep that in mind if you're looking to create collaborative relationships with other partners. So let's just look at what, what I mean by that. So here we have Liam again. He's visiting Nancy Nurse about those headaches. Um, but now he's admitted to Nancy that he thinks he might have an addiction to pills. So Nancy refers him to a local drug treatment program for assessment and possible services. They jointly make an appointment for him, which is scheduled for the next day. Several days later, Nancy calls the clinic <coughs> to confirm that Liam showed up for the appointment. What, if anything, may the clinic tell Nancy Nurse? <coughs> now, were this under our CMIA, um, Nancy would be able to confirm whether or not uh, Liam showed up for his appointment. That would be allowed under HIPAA and CMIA. But <coughs> if the substance abuse treatment program is protected by these additionally uh, um, protected uh, federal laws, they cannot confirm whether or not Liam showed up because uh, CAPTOR doesn't have that exception. So if Nancy wants to make sure that Liam connects and receives services, she needs to think ahead about getting a release form um, signed by Liam that would allow the substance abuse treatment program to communicate with Nancy and confirm the referral and warm handoff. Um, now, let's say that Liam is receiving uh, services at this program, and during a counseling session, the therapist notices burn marks on Liam's arm, and he admits his dad got angry with him while he was high and burned Liam. <coughs> um, I wanted to put this in because even though I have just told you that these are incredibly strict confidentiality laws, they do also have an exception that allows mandated reporters of child abuse to make a report when they believe that their duty has been triggered. So in this case, even though the records of this substance program are protected by CAPTOR, this uh, 
counselor would be able to make a child abuse report in this case if they thought that they had a reasonable suspicion of abuse. Uh, okay, so that's real quick HIPAA. Now let's talk about uh, FERPA and release of records that are held by uh, schools. Um, so in the same way, when we're talking about confidentiality of uh, school information, we have a federal law and we have state law. At the federal level, we have the uh, Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, and we also have at the state level, education code. But whereas with HIPAA, we said HIPAA is a ground floor and we look to California law um, if it provides additional confidentiality, it's sort of the reverse here. FERPA sort of says, I'm king of the castle and I control, and if your state law is in conflict with FERPA, then uh, you really need to follow FERPA. So um, in this case, uh, schools in California pretty much are following the same rules that schools in Nevada or North Carolina or Massachusetts are. Um, so very different than healthcare providers. Um, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act was passed several decades ago and it had two goals. One, to protect the privacy of education records, but also to ensure that parents can access their children's records. And that's important um, because that is one of the key differences you'll see uh, with, between FERPA and HIPAA. Who is subject to FERPA? Um, any public or private agency which receives uh, federal education dollars, and that could be federal dollars that go down through a state education program, um, if that agency provides educational services or instruction or is authorized to direct or control schools. So that could be your school district or your school uh, board, county board, but it also is the, the school itself. And FERPA can extend to cover um, organizations that contract with or consult with an educational agency, <coughs> as well as any person or acting for or employed by such agency. <coughs> Um, FERPA protects what are called education records. That means records, filings, recordings, other, other ways of documenting um, information if that information um, it directly relates to a student and is maintained by that educational agency or individual who works for a school. Um, education records include anything about that young person that are documented or recorded in some way. And that means it can include health information. Um, examples of health records you might find within an education record <coughs> might be immunization, maybe some of the testing and evaluation related to an IEP. Uh, but it's important to know that FERPA does not treat health information in an education record any different than it does attendance records or grades or other information that would commonly be found in an education record. Um, so like HIPAA, the general rule in FERPA is that an education agency cannot release person, personally identifiable information without written consent. And just like HIPAA, FERPA has its own rules about what that consent needs to include, the elements it needs to include to be valid. Um, we list those in the primer and on the website, so again, really important to make sure that any form you're using complies with FERPA if you're an educational agency. Um, and again, pointing out that the gold standard really is that valid written release because it really allows you to shape to whom the information is shared, what's shared, um, how long it lasts, um, and make sure that both the family and the youth, as well as the partners, are all on the same page about information sharing. Um, without that release, you can only release information if an exception allows or requires uh, that disclosure. Um, before we get to those exceptions, let's just quickly look at who signs the release. Um, when it's FERPA, um, the parent signs a release for any student under 18, there is no such thing as minor consent. So under 18, it's always a parent. Um, if they're 18 or older, the student signs. Um, FERPA defines parent for this purpose to mean a natural parent, guardian, or individual acting as a parent in the absence of a parent or guardian. 
um, a little bit broader than perhaps what we typically think of. Um, it's also really important to look at your local school district policy because typically this term is defined in local policy and it may be slightly more narrow than FERPA. Um, so take a look at that if you're trying to figure out who can sign that release form. Um, if you can't get a release form, as we said, there are some exceptions that allow uh, release without that form in place. Um, again, there's quite a few of them, including for emergencies, for child abuse reporting, for research. Um, we talk about each of these exceptions in more detail in the primer. Um, for today, I'm just going to mention one, the one that uh, people tend to have the most questions about, which is um, legitimate educational interest. So FERPA says that school officials may share information from an education record with other school officials in the same school or in the same entity as long as they have leg legitimate educational interest in the information. And legitimate educational interest can be defined to mean that the official needs the information in order to fulfill his or her professional responsibility. Um, school official is defined to include uh, most folks that are working at a school site. So it could include the teachers, principals, school nurses, school counselors, um, others who are working in that system. And legitimate educational interest is basically saying if the teacher needs that information in order to fulfill their duty and professional responsibility, then they may access that record. So this exception really um, creates an opportunity for folks working at, in the same school system to share information and collaborate around students that they all are working with and in common. Now, what happens when we've got healthcare at a school site? So we know that community clinics, folks, healthcare providers who are working outside of the school system generally must follow HIPAA. We know that school employees are generally subject to FERPA, but what happens when we have school-based health and mental health care? And the answer is, it depends. Um, so let's, let's look at what it depends on. Um, HIPAA, FERPA, both or neither. The first thing we can say for sure is that it is not possible to operate under FERPA and HIPAA at the same time, because HIPAA explicitly states in black and white law that its rules do not apply to health information held in an education record subject to FERPA. So if FERPA applies, HIPAA does not. So that's the first thing. So how do we know if FERPA applies? This is an algorithm, a, a shot from the primer. You also have this up on the website. It's sort of a list of questions to ask to figure out whether your school-based services are subject to HIPAA or FERPA. So our first question is, is the provider of healthcare an educational agency or the employee or agent of one? And if yes, then FERPA applies to the information that they're documenting and generating. Um, how do we know if a health provider is an educational um, employee or agent? Um, the Federal Department of Health and Human Services and Federal Department of Education issued what is called the Joint Guidance a number of years ago now in which they had attempted to give folks um, some parameters for answering this question. Um, what's important to know is that there's not an easy answer because it, it is case by case. Um, relevant factors can include operational and administrative control of, of the services being provided, um, the types of services and functions being provided, um, and the financing. So they do provide a couple examples in the joint guidance. Um, typically, a school nurse would be, records created by a school nurse would be subject to FERPA. Um, one of the questions they ask in the joint guidance is, well, what if that school nurse is being funded by an outside agency? And what the two federal departments said is even um, if it's being funded by an outside agency, but the services being provided are traditional school nurse services, if the school nurse is still employed in the school district and operational and administrative control is still under the district, 
then that school nurse's records are still subject to FERPA. So even though financing coming from someplace else, if the other two components are still within um, education control, that would be FERPA. Um, on the flip side, they gave an example. If uh, a nurse who works for the um, County Department of Public Health comes onto campus to provide uh, immunizations, um, this is a service that furthers the goal of the public health department. Um, the services and the nurses' time are being funded by the Department of Public Health. Um, the simple fact that they happen to be on school district property doesn't make those records subject to FERPA and they would still be subject to HIPAA. So it really is uh, incumbent on each program to look at um, the types of services they're providing, the structure, and determine whether FERPA applies. If FERPA does uh, not apply, the next question is whether this is uh, an entity that is uh, can be called a covered entity and therefore subject to HIPAA, um, and then you check to see if California law applies. Um, and why does it matter? So it, it will, first, let me say, this is often what I get. Oh my gosh, Rebecca, this is really hard. Can't we just write an MOU and say we're HIPAA or we're FERPA and just leave it at that? And the answer is not really, because if all of those legal factors we just talked about line up to make it crystal clear that the school nurses' records are subject to FERPA or that school-based mental health counselor who comes from that outside entity is subject to HIPAA, um, you can't just change that by contract. The law is the law. Um, but uh, one way or another, it can be helpful to address confidentiality in an MOU. Um, and this is why we always say it's so important to work with legal counsel and look at these things up front um, so that they can help you sort out whether you're HIPAA or FERPA um, and uh, within an MOU then talk about what that means for purposes of sharing information and control of information. Um, now, why does it matter um, whether a records are subject to HIPAA or FERPA? It does have implications. It has implications on parents' ability to access information. Um, there is no minor consent confidentiality uh, under FERPA. So if a mental health counselor who is clearly subject to FERPA working in a school system is providing um, minor consent therapy, the records being created are not uh, sort of subject to the minor's control in the same way they would be if these were services being provided by a therapist subject to HIPAA. Um, it does impact whether other school staff or other medical providers can access those records. Uh, remember, if records are subject to FERPA and they're in the educational record, then that means that um, folks with legitimate educational interests within that school uh, setting may be able to access those without needing permission. Um, it may limit or create more opportunities to coordinate care with teachers or with outside agencies. Um, and it also impacts administrative rules um, in terms of the types of forms you use and the different advisements that you need to give to clients. And we talk about all of these in more detail on the website and um, in the primer. Um, but let's just look at why, how that impacts sharing on the ground. So our first case is 11-year-old Andre. He's been receiving mental health counseling at a school-based health center. The clinician believes Andre is progressing, but wants to see if the progress is translating into better behavior in the classroom and better academic results. She asks to see the grades and class reports on Andre. Um, so our question is, may the school give the school-based health clinician access to that information. Before we can answer that, we need to understand whether this counselor's records are subject to HIPAA or FERPA. Um, so all we know is that this is a school-based health center. Let's say for purposes of argument that these records are subject to FERPA because this is a, um, a school-employed mental health counselor um, who is in under all those factors, um, under the control and operation of the school 
district. Um, FERPA sa says that uh, um, anyone within that same school setting can access information in an education record if they have a legitimate educational interest in that information. Um, if the counselor can make an argument that in order to further the, her ends to be able to provide good counseling, she needs to be able to take a look at his grades um, or his behavior reports in the education file, then the, the clinician may be able to access those records under the legitimate educational interest exception in FERPA. So FERPA may allow this clinician to access that information without needing assigned release. Um, if this clinician were operating under HIPAA, there is no exception that would allow an outside, someone outside of the school entity to access the education record um, uh, without getting that signed release. So in this case, being subject to FERPA and a school employee actually facilitates sharing um, and access to information um, for the counselor regarding Andre. Um, now, may the clinician participate in team meetings and share general information about Andre's treatment? It's really common to find teams at schools where we have uh, school counselors, teachers, perhaps some outside entities sitting at the table. It really depends who's there, and again, HIPAA and FERPA will make a big difference whether this counselor is able to share information out about Andre's treatment. If the counseling records are subject to FERPA, then the clinician could use the legitimate educational interest exception to share some information out with partners at the table who are in the same um, school uh, entity, like teachers. Um, for example, if this clinician is joining the meeting and his uh, records are subject to HIPAA, there is no exception in HIPAA that would allow sharing with the teachers and other non-health licensed healthcare staff uh, short of having a signed release. Um, now that you will, you'll see at the bottom of this slide, we have um, arrows pointing both ways. One of the reasons um, we put this graphic in is it's really important to highlight that sometimes when we have folks sitting at a table, it's possible for some partners to share information from their protected records out where their, the partner can't share information from their records. So the counselor may be able to sit at the table and receive information from um, school staff, but the counselor can't share back out. And this is where, again, unless this has been addressed up front and folks understand the way that this, the legal um, uh, information sharing laws work, it can create some tension and frustration when folks feel like, well, I'm sharing, why aren't you sharing? Um, so laying that out and understanding the parameters under which each of us works um, can really help uh, facilitate collaboration down the line when we understand, okay, I get it. You need that signed release to be able to share with us, so let's make sure we work together to get it. But in the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and, and share with you what I know I'm allowed to share. Um, all right, our next case, Happy High School, has a school-based health center run by a local community clinic on campus. There's a monthly meeting with various school staff and other on-campus supports, including the school-based health center. So again, team meetings, really common. Student who's already receiving substance use services at the school-based health center comes up in the, in the joint meeting. The school counselor suggests that her meetings with the youth lead her to want to connect the student with one of the other on-campus supports for substance use services. Um, so school staff, school counselor is saying, hey, I'm concerned about this person. I think they need substance use in, um, services. School-based health center provider is sitting there, knows that this young person is receiving such, such services. Can they let the team know the youth is already receiving services from them? Um, if this school-based health center is subject to HIPAA, 
and or federal um, confidentiality, substance use confidentiality law, then they cannot share anything without having a written release from the youth. Uh, now, it would come from the youth, since this is a minor consent service, um, and so it is certainly possible for the school-based health center to go back to the young person and say, hey, you know, there's a couple of folks on campus who are really concerned about you. May we get your written permission to let them know you have connected with services, um, but it is up to the young person to provide that permission or not. And if they don't, um, the school-based health center cannot share information at that um, meeting. Um, Okay, I think we're going to go to questions. I just wanted to point out again this website where we now have um, a lot of the primer information living live, so you could dig in much greater depth into all of the different topics we've touched on today, um, including some frequently asked questions and some more case scenarios. Um, but let's see, for now, can we... Um, uh, uh, Sierra, do we have some yep. questions? Uh-huh, thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, the first question is, what if the educational records are operating under FERPA and in this team meeting an outside agency contractor is sitting in who may be operating, operating under HIPAA? Would that limit the school-based mental health provider from disclosing information of services? Okay, so we've got um, a school counselor who has been providing services um, the school counselor's records are subject to FERPA. Sitting at a team meeting where, let's say, most of the folks at that team meeting are school employees, but we do have one outside individual, their outside provider, who is not part of that school system. Um, what FERPA says is our general rule is we need that written release to disclose information um, unless one of our limited exceptions applies. The legitimate educational interest exception says you can share information without need of a release if it's to other school officials, meaning other folks who are part of that school system, and they have um, that legitimate educational interest in getting that information. They need that information to meet their professional duties. Um, if there's that outside person there who's not a school official, they would not be able to share information with that person. So if they're sitting at that table, you would not be able, able to disclose anything that is protected by FERPA. You would need that release form or you'd need to ask that individual to leave the room. Um, but this is where, this is exactly why, you know, we encourage folks to think about getting those release forms signed up front at the beginning of a school year. It's impossible to get the 100% um, but think about um, those kinds of situations and what what you think you may need releases for down the line. Uh, um, and I will say, always go back to your uh, legal counsel for this kind of thing because it all comes down to the details and the specific facts. And so the, the scenario we just talked about, um, you would really want to look at it, um, ex exactly who we're talking about and whether this is HIPAA or FERPA and what that means. Okay, our next question is, uh, if the mental health provider is working under FERPA and uh, can the client cannot sign under minor consent and the client cannot sign under minor consent, parents, so parents need to know, oh, sorry, they're popping up so fast. So parents need to know, um, oh, shoot. I, I see it. I see the question. Yeah, you see it? Um, okay, awesome. Yeah. So. If you are a mental health counselor providing services at a school site and you are employed by the school, it's important to keep uh, two things separate. One is consent to treatment and one is authorization to release information. Consent to treatment laws have nothing to do with HIPAA or FERPA. So, and, and they are the same consent to treatment laws, whether you're in a school setting, whether you're in an outside clinic, uh, whether you're in a hospital. So minor consent still opens the door to services, whether this happens to be a school mental health counselor or an outside entity. So a, a young person who's 15 could consent to mental health 
counseling with a school employed counselor. What where HIPAA and FERPA come in to play is what happens with the records created once you've engaged in that um, therapy therapeutic relationship. So if a school employed counselor is providing minor consent therapy, um, those and those records are subject to FERPA. There's no affirmative obligation to in FERPA to tell parents your child is receiving services here, but if the parent comes to the school and demands to see the, the records, um, the therapist cannot promise the young person your parents will never see these records. Um, it's really important to talk to legal counsel about exactly what the parameters are of what a parent might be able to see, but a therapist employed by a school cannot guarantee confidentiality, minor consent confidentiality, in the same way that a therapist working independently in a community clinic or through the Department of Mental Health uh, might be able to. Um, and so that's something to talk through with clients and if, and if confidentiality is really critical to them, um, maybe even think about referral. But again, really important to talk to your own legal counsel about what exactly parents can access in an education record when it comes to um, health and therapy notes. Um, the next one, so to clarify, the school-based mental health provider employed by the school are allowed to give basic information regarding co confirming participation in counseling and possibly goals and or progress with a school professional that is need to know. Um, could you could you say that? Yeah, let me read that one more time. I'm also I'm also grasping it as well. So to clarify, the school-based mental health provider employed by the school are allowed to give basic information regarding uh, uh, regarding confirming participation in counseling and possibly goals and or progress with a school professional that is need to know. So sharing um, a school-based mental health provider employed by the school, I'm assuming that they're referring to under FERPA, can share information with other FERPA school professionals on, on a like uh, need-to-know basis. FERPA creates more opportunity for that to be the case, and I would look to legal counsel to help exactly sort of pinpoint the parameters and with whom and how we apply legitimate educational interests. But FERPA creates more opportunity for that um, than would HIPAA. Okay. Um, if you are a mental health counselor in school, can you have separate HIPAA notes, records that are filed separately outside of the academic records? In the primer, we have much more information about what is considered an education record. There are some exceptions, um, certain kinds of information that is not part of an education record, including personal notes and in some cases health information for students 18 or older. Um, I would take a look at those exceptions, um, which as I said, we provide more information about it in the primer um, and, and talk to legal counsel about what that means if you're um, sort of keeping personal notes as a school uh, nurse or a school counselor providing professional services. Um, it's a, it's a a common question, and it's, but it's one where you have to be really uh, careful about sort of how, how broadly you interpret personal notes. Um, this one is, if there is a ROI from the outside agency, does the school need another one from the parent slash caregiver? I'm not sure. Yeah, that's it. No, that's a great question. ROI is release of information. Um, there's no need for you to create your own release of information, but you do need to make sure that any release of information that you accept complies with either HIPAA or FERPA, depending what kind of records you have. 
Um, this is where, again, working with your partners, if there are certain partners you work with frequently, if you're able to create a joint form or agree, have an understanding that we'll all use the form created by XYZ agency, and our legal counsel all has signed off and said, yep, this complies with HIPAA or FERPA, um, then there's no reason not to use simply one form and keep things easier for parents and, and kids. Um, it also is possible to create a form that complies with both HIPAA and FERPA and, and allows uh, a parent or youth to uh, uh, authorize release of both education and health records at the same time. Um, you just have to keep track of who needs to sign what, particularly um, with the parent minor consent issue. Okay, and the last question, if you, are an education, if you are an educationally related mental health therapist operating under FERPA, is it required for the intake psychosocio assessment to have a mental health diagnosis? Um, I am not sure if that's a HIPAA FERPA question, question. exactly. Mm -hmm. it, it may be that I don't fully understand it, and it may be one that needs its best um, addressed by legal counsel who can get into real specific details um, about it. Great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, let's see, I think we have a few more slides left. Uh, just again, uh, for more information, you can go to teenhealthlaw.org and look at the toolkit there. Um, we have our contact information listed on this slide. If you'd like to reach out to us, you can reach us at these emails and phone numbers. You can also go to the website, the schoolhealthcenters.org HIPAA FERPA website to uh, look at some of the other uh, frequently asked questions and scenarios that are on the website. And lastly, um, the California School-Based Health Alliance has our annual conference coming up uh, May 14th through 15th. This conference is for school-based school, school -based health providers, school admin, school nurses. Um, it's a broad audience, and we are actually accepting abstracts as we speak. So if you're interested in submitting an abstract, you can go ahead and go to our website and find the instructions there. Thank you so much for all of your time, um, and have a wonderful rest of your day.